Hello, I'm Michael Fopp, and uh, what you're about to see is a short presentation that I gave for my old school um, for Remembrance Day in 2020. Uh, my school is the Reading Bluecoat School in, in Sonning in, in Berkshire, founded in 1660. And the ceremonial uniform of the school is, of course, the uniform of those days, uh, a blue gown with yellow socks and breeches. And we all had to wear that when I was there as a border between 1959 and 1960. I'm now um, obviously uh, an old boy. And the headmaster recently asked me during the COVID pandemic if I would give a talk at a virtual meeting of some of the older old boys, the Richard Aldworth Society, those old boys who left the school before 1979. Well, I left there in 1964, so I qualify. Uh, so what I did was I put together this short talk on remembrance and on the Remembrance Day and its ritual. And then that was recorded uh, when it was given over Zoom um, in November 2020. So I was asked to do the talk and, and here it is. Right, before we all went to Blue Coats, our parents were given a list, a list of all the stuff that we had to take with us. And uh, I, I've got a lovely photograph somewhere in a box, probably in the attic, which shows me uh, in a uniform that wasn't for a border, it was a uniform for a day boy. I had the short trousers, the gray socks, the blazer, the big badge, um, I wore it once and that was for the photograph in my grandmother's garden in Bristol when I was 10 and everything was about for a size 12, uh, everything I would grow into and because it was on the list um, my parents bought it and being a boarder of course I never wore it again because it was a day boys uniform and as soon as I got to Home Park in uh, 1959 uh, I realized that my trunk was full of stuff that I would no longer need. But one of the things that was in there, which I've used ever since in the 60 or so years since I left, was what you see there. And that's the dictionary that we all had to buy. And uh, I've just copied out the word remembrance from the, from the dictionary that I was required to take two blue coats with me in 1959. And the definition, a retained mental impression, memory, the act or fact of remembering, the power or faculty of remembering, the length of time over which recollection or memory extends. All these things are what we do when we celebrate remembrance. And in fact, it's what we are doing today in our remembering of our time together at a place that unified us all, all those years ago. So remembrance is more than just that week during November. And in some countries, it's not in November, and I'll talk about that. And in some countries, it's not a week. In some countries, it's only the day. Um, but it's remembrance is, is more than just um, something we do at one particular time of the year. Remembrance is something which is quite fundamental to our human psyche. And it's so terribly, terribly important uh, that we keep our memories in order that we can remember them. So the definition taken out of my schoolboy dictionary, which is still on the shelf behind me. In fact, these Zoom um, talks are, are very, very helpful because I'm sitting in my study in Buckinghamshire and I've got over a thousand books around me, which um, means when I get asked awkward questions, I've got four computer screens and a thousand books. Hopefully I'll be able to answer them. But the background to remembrance. <clears throat> remembrance goes back to Greek and Roman times. But the modern sort of remembrance comes straight out of the armistice signed in the village of Compiègne in France 
1918. Um, it was signed at five o'clock in the morning between the Germans, the French and the British, the Central Powers and, and the Allies. And this photograph was taken at the time. Um, five o'clock in the morning and they agreed that they would cease fire, not, a, not, not peace, they would cease fire, an armistice, at 11 a.m. on the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918. That didn't actually happen. Um, it was reported in the New York Times uh, by a journalist that, in fact, uh, shells still carried on firing until about uh, midnight of the day. So uh, obviously it got, took some time um, to, uh, to disseminate the information. But uh, straight away, we had an armistice and great celebrations throughout the world because um, it was the first true world war. Um, celebrations that, that were uh, tempered by the fact that so many had died. But it took until the 28th of June 1919 for the treaty to be signed, um, the Versailles Treaty, signed in the Hall of Mirrors in, the, in, in, in Versailles, in, in Paris. Um, many people said that that treaty was in fact the declaration of the Second World War because it was so draconian and demanded such reparations from Germany for the damage that uh, she had caused uh, in, in the First World War. So it was um, a peace treaty signed in 1919 which triggered the remembrance ceremonies that we now have. And the first Armistice Day celebration that was held was actually in Buckingham Palace. And it was a dinner hosted by King George V, a banquet in honor of the President of the French Republic. And that was on the evening of the 10th of November, uh, 1919, before the official first Armistice Day on the 11th of November, 1919. And that was how um, it started. And of course, all the ritual that I shall talk about that goes with Remembrance uh, and Remembrance Day and Armistice Day, because they've now been separated, uh, came after that. But what are we talking about? I don't, you don't need to look at all those numbers, but uh, we talk about uh, the Great War. The Central Powers, 65 million people mobilized. The uh, Allies, 42 million. The killed and died, you can see 5,152,000 on the Allied side and 8,538,000 on the Central Powers side. But the wounded, massive numbers of people, everybody was affected. And look at the size of the mobilized percentage of the population that when you look down, particularly in Russia, um, as in the Second World War, and France, of course. There's no question that France, uh, in, on the Allied side, France and Russia um, participated sig significantly in, in the First World War. So those are the sorts of numbers that we're talking about of the number of people um, involved missing, wounded, prisoners and dead in the First World War. A massive destruction of youth. Also that left behind a massive number of bereaved people, particularly women and families and siblings of those who died or those who were missing, or those who could not be found. And it was an outpouring of grief and a spontaneous public desire to remember. And they selected Armistice Day. And uh, initially, the focus was, was not an official focus. There wasn't a government sort of decree that uh, we would do this and we would do that. And some of the things I'll be showing you, the earliest commemorations, you can see that they are actually quite disorganized when you compare them to how they're done today. Armistice Day 11th of November was selected for obvious reasons um, and initially as I say there was no real focus on, on how the ceremony would be done 
But they started to create symbols and the first symbol was this, the Cenotaph in London for the 11th of November 1919 for the President of France and King George V to visit after their dinner in Buckingham Palace the night before. And the um, Government Works Department was given the job of building something in the city of Westminster and they chose Whitehall and their chief architect at the time was Sir Edwin Lutyens who had designed a number of public buildings. He had been contracted by Gertrude Jekyll the very famous garden designer to build and landscape um, build a structure in one of her landscape gardens and he built a seat in the garden which a librarian had referred to as a cenotaph and he, he it was the first time that he'd really considered what a cenotaph was and a cenotaph is a greek word for empty tomb and they are they exist or cenotaphs of different types exist throughout the world and they certainly existed in ancient Greece and in Rome. So he came up with this idea a few weeks before Armistice Day, literally weeks, about, about two, or two or three months in actual fact, he was asked to design something for the ceremony to celebrate the first, uh, if you like, remembrance of those who had not survived the First World War. And the response from the public was amazing. Millions of people came. And this first cenotaph was built out of plaster and canvas uh, and scaffolding poles and wood and timber. Uh, it looks identical to the one that you could see in, the, in Whitehall today. The differences are that the one in Whitehall today is an exact copy of this one, um, except the laurel wreaths that are on the original are original laurel and the laurel wreaths on the permanent memorial that was built for the year after are part of the stone. Lutyens um, was very keen on something that was magisterial but secular. He didn't want, because of the variety of religions that were associated, uh, were involved in the in the First World War, he didn't think it appropriate that it should have a religious connotation. So the cenotaph has no religious symbols on it whatsoever. The laurel wreaths are in remembrance and the flags that were put round are where to commemorate the various military sides of, of war. The, the, the empty tomb is on the top, on the very top of the cenotaph and it has a domed top. There isn't a single straight um, 90 degree perpendicular or horizontal surface on the cenotaph. If all of its bits were joined together, it would be a massive sphere. And Lutyens wanted to do that to commemorate the fact that this was the first world war. So he actually had in his mind when he designed it, a huge globe rather than what you see that was built. So if all of the edges of that cenotaph were joined together, they would form a sphere that was 500 feet high and 300 feet below the ground. So when you look at it as what it looks like, a vertical perpendicular monument, in actual fact, when you line all of those angles up it becomes a sphere. So that's 1919 and here are the cenotaphs that were created as a result of Lutyen's designs and here is his original drawing from the Imperial War Museum and you can see that they were very faithful to it when they built when the the, the government building workers built it. Here is Lutyen's himself and there is the, at the top there is the, the current day um, uh, cenotaph. And as you can see, they have been copied in one way or another. And I've inserted, because we have representatives from Singapore and South Africa here, 
the cenotaphs from Singapore and Durban in South Africa, and the one in Auckland in New Zealand. I've chosen Auckland because they have a different Remembrance Day um, than we do for a, a, a very practical reason, which I'll come to eventually. So ritual starts to be embedded into the remembrance ceremonies as soon as this first cenotaph in 1919 is constructed. The ritual starts because the public come, mainly women, from all over the country to lay flowers in front of it, as you can see. And those flowers are not poppies. The idea of a poppy had not come up yet. Not in this country anyway. They are primarily white flowers because white and carnations, of course, it's November as well, but they're primarily white flowers because white is a symbol of remembrance. So the ritual starts to become embedded in the nation. And here we've got Lutchins walking away from that original cenotaph, actually looking quite pleased with himself. And I've got every reason to believe he was because it was such a success. Every widow, every brother or sister who had lost somebody, particularly those who didn't know where they were, had they, they were missing, felt that this cenotaph, this empty tomb, was a connection with the person that they had lost. And it became extremely popular. In 1919, King George V proclaimed that there would be a period of silence. And that was the first formalized piece of remembrance that became common. And uh, articles from the newspapers at the time make a point of saying that this was new and not everybody knew what to do. The Manchester Guardian, for example, because they would fire a gun or a maroon or ring a bell at 11 o'clock um, and then people were expected to do whatever and nobody knew what to do. Manchester Guardian reported that people heard the maroon um, and they stopped in the street and some men started to take their hats off and of course 99.9% .9 of the male population in those days wore a hat and then more people took their hats off and people stopped and the trams stopped, and the buses stopped, and so on. And they decided before 19, the 11th of November 1920 that there should be the press and public return wanted as somebody returned from the battlefields. There had been a lot of emphasis and a lot of letters to members of parliament, to the king, asking for the return of next of kin to be buried in the UK or in Australia or in New Zealand or, or wherever. And it was decided by the government that the logistics, just the logistics alone, would not allow that to happen. So something else had to be done. So the cenotaph was turned from a temporary structure in 1919 to a permanent structure in 1920 by turning that taking down that temporary structure and building one out of portland stone to replace it and that was all done in about a month before the 11th of november it was also decided that the permanent structure would represent the first major ceremonial to celebrate remembrance on armistice day on the 11th of november by bringing home an unknown soldier to represent all of those who had fallen and who were not known and had unmarked graves or graves that were marked with known known to God or unknown soldier or unknown warrior or whatever. And this was to solve the problem of the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of letters that they were getting from particularly widows and mothers who had lost their sons or husbands, asking for them to be repatriated. The army's confidential reports from the time 
get quite worked up about this. They point out to the, um, the government that bringing home the fallen would be a bigger logistical exercise than fighting the war in the first place. The other alternative was that the families wanted to visit the graves. And they then pointed out that that would be as big a logistical exercise as supplying the army in the field during the First World War. But there was eventually a solution to that. So there was a decision to bring home one single soldier. The, the, initially, the word soldier was used. And the announcement, when that was made, almost solved, it almost stopped the hue and cry that we should bring home all of them. Because particularly those that were unidentified, it gave the next of kin something tangible to think about and to see. So it was greeted with universal approval. And uh, by 1926, rituals really did start to, to get um, formalized. Because I'm going to talk in a moment about the bringing home of the unknown soldier. Um, but by 1926, virtually everything that we see today had been established because, and you'll see in a video that I'm going to play, um, a lot of things were going wrong. For example, um, the unknown soldier was buried with a field marshal's honours. Um, that meant he had a 19-gun salute. Um, every time a gun went off, the pigeons started to rise during the two minute silence. So it was decided that they would not synchronize, they were not synchronized properly. In the city of London, rather than in Westminster, instead of firing a gun or waiting for Big Ben to chime, they would fire a maroon. Well, the maroon was making the pigeons go. And when the Big Ben went in Westminster, not all the clocks were synchronized. So during the 10 minute silence, Westminster Abbey's clock went, Westminster Hall's clock went, the Home Office's clock went, which was in Whitehall in those days, and so on and so on. So all sorts of things. And also by 1926, people were turning up at memorial services all over the country wearing the medals that their next of kin had earned and had been sent to them by post because they were dead. And that was against the law. It was a, actually a, a law where you could not wear military medals if you had not been awarded them. So that was changed. And now it's common practice for medals to be worn on the opposite side uh, by next of kin at memorial services and memorial events. So the ritual that's embedded that we take for granted today came about as a result of trial and error. An unknown British soldier, this became the unknown warrior. And this was the word that was, these words were scratched or, or um, penciled on a wooden cross in the garden of a chateau being used by officers on the Western Front um, in 1915. And one of the officers that was billeted in this chateau was Reverend David Railton. And he was in the garden um, having a, a drink with some of his colleagues. And at the end of the garden uh, were a, a couple of, of graves. As France was full of graves. They, they didn't come together into large graveyards that we know today until significantly later after the, the First World War. So this, he went down to the end of the the garden to pay his respects to these uh, men who were lying in, in these graves. And he noticed that one of them had scrawled in pencil across it, an unknown British soldier. And I think it was the Scots Dragoon Guards underneath. And that never left his brain uh, until he kept on talking about it. He thought it was a very, very profound thing that written on this Cross was an unknown British soldier. And he wrote, uh, and he kept on talking about this right the way through from 1915, right the way through till the end of the war. 
Uh, and his wife said to him, look, you've been going on about this for four or five years. Write to somebody, do something about it. Because he felt that one of these soldiers ought to be brought home to represent all the others. So he wrote uh, to the prime minister. Well, first of all, he wrote to the Dean of Westminster. Um, he thought he'd go to a senior clergyman first, Bishop, Dean of Westminster, um, who also thought it was a fantastic idea and also would solve all these issues about the next of kin wanting some, something that they could identify with and go and see and go and do. So he wrote to the um, Dean of Westminster who contacted Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, who contacted the King, King George V. King George V was against it. He said that it's 1920, um, the war's been over two years, this peace has all been signed, we should just all forget about it and walk away. Uh, Lloyd George convinced him that the public um, desire was to have this. So they decided very, very late, way, way, uh, literally days before the 11th of November 1920, to bring home a soldier. And they turned the word soldier to warrior because, of course, they weren't just soldiers. There were airmen, there were sailors, um, and there were other uh, types of troop um, who died and, and, and lived or were in unmarked graves. So a state funeral and all the ceremony of burying one unknown warrior and placing him in a distinguished place in Westminster Abbey was contrived by Lord Curzon, the Earl Marshal of the day, um, literally weeks before the 11th of November 1920. And this is a cut down couple of minutes of the Pathé news uh, that was made of the journey of the unknown warrior from France to Westminster Abbey, which I've added uh, a little bit of the battle is over on the pipes and the last post on the bugle. Um, and uh, you can see from this uh, how it's organized, but slightly disorganized. This is in Boulogne, escorted by the French. Marshal Foch was there. Again, white flowers. HMS Verdun was chosen to carry the body to Dover Harbour. Marshal Foch there. Verdun comes into Dover. When he came on board Verdun, he was given the um, bosun's calls of an admiral of the fleet, the same equivalent in the Navy as a field marshal. Victoria Station, he stayed at overnight, guarded. Bodies have always been guarded on battlefields of dead soldiers, way back to Greek and Roman times, for obvious reasons, so they weren't robbed. This is the cenotaph and the king placing a wreath on top of the bier. And as you can see, they haven't worked that out in advance because it's a bit too high for him. So it's waiting there while he unveils the permanent cenotaph and as usual that didn't work particularly well either and then they move to Westminster Abbey Prince of Wales service chiefs
the tin helmet on the casket and also King George V had chosen from the royal collection a crusader's sword which was also placed on top of the casket. The casket was made from oak from Hampton Court and bound in steel. The soldier or the the warrior was chosen he was brought from far well there's 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 some dispute as to whether there were four or six a nurse that worked at the uh, hospital in saint paul where they were brought to claims there were six uh, the official records say there were four brought from battlefields different battlefields in france um, with orders to the soldiers that they had no idea why they were exhuming bodies and bringing them there. They were then taken to the citadel in, in um, St. Paul uh, and placed in the library, which was turned into a temporary chapel. Um, and uh, a lieutenant colonel and a brigadier and a chaplain went into the, um, the, the chapel the night before the 10th of November. Um, and blindfolded or eyes closed, the brigadier just touched one of the bodies. That body was then put into the casket which had been prepared, um, and the other bodies were then uh, reinterred uh, in military cemetery um, with the reverend who had, had been with them uh, in, uh, in St. Paul. They were then taken to Boulogne, as you saw, and then um, brought to, to England. There was an uproar about who should be there at the ceremony. Um, and it was questions in Parliament and all sorts of things. And there was a, a, a big controversy about it should not be the privileged who were present in Westminster Abbey. Uh, it should be the bereaved and those most connected uh, with the war rather than politicians and privileged people. So the decision was made that uh, the audience would uh, contain, uh, and there were more actually, than 100 women who'd lost their husbands and all their sons. And as you saw, um, the uh, coffin was taken in with a, a, a carrying party but it was escorted by 100 holders of the Victoria Cross and 100 sandbags full of soil from the various battlefields of France were brought over with the unknown soldier, warrior, and they were used to inter him. And there he is uh, in his casket. Um, the Union Jack flag or the Union flag that is over the casket uh, in the painting um, was actually David Railton's, the, the chaplain's flag that he used as an altar cloth to give services to the troops on the Western Front. And that flag uh, was used at the Remembrance Service this year to cover the, um, uh, the altar at Westminster Abbey for the um, socially distanced service that um, was held. The Tomb of the Unknown Warrior is the only tomb in Westminster Abbey which may not be walked on. It's the only tomb in Westminster Abbey that for whatever occasion uh, is never ever covered up. For royal weddings and other ma major occasions where the, the abbey is full, tombs are covered with yellow, uh, with sorry, with red red carpets. The Tomb of the Unknown Soldier is never ever covered. And in uh, 1933 when Elizabeth Bowes Lyon uh, married the Duke of York, uh, the future King George VI, on her way out of Westminster Abbey, she laid her bridal bouquet on the tomb. So that became a tradition and a ritual which has been undertaken by all <coughs> uh, royal weddings uh, ever since. And indeed, excuse me, <coughs> indeed, um, when the Queen Mother died, um, she had wished that the wreath from her coffin was laid there.
And the, the day after her funeral, the Queen visited privately and put the wreath on the tomb of the unknown warrior. And you may have seen in the, in the papers and on the news uh, a couple of days before this year's uh, Remembrance Sunday, the Queen made a private visit and left a posy on the tomb of the same flowers that she had for her wedding. So the unknown warrior. And there are unknown warriors in a number of countries, um, the United States and for, for various wars as well, uh, Australia, New Zealand, um, mainly Commonwealth and Empire countries. Um, and they, and France, of course, uh, in the Arc de Triomphe in, in France, uh, only one has ever been identified. Um, and that was the to tomb of the unknown warrior from Vietnam in the United States. And uh, there's ne not been <coughs> a particularly vehement desire to identify any of the others. It's just that the particular soldier from Vietnam, the were indications of who he was before he was brought over. And with modern DNA testing, it was decided that he would be returned to his family. And of course, the American system is different than ours anyway. Well, it's different than ours up until 1982. Up until 1982, if you're in the British Armed Forces, you were buried where you fell or at sea. Um, in 1982, the uproar was so great during the Falklands War that Margaret Thatcher changed that and families had the right to ask for their next of kin to be repatriated. The Americans have always had that right. And of course they have their national cemetery uh, in Arlington, uh, Virginia. Let's talk about poppies for a moment. They were not an originally a, a British thing. Um, Madame Anna Guren uh, was a charity leader, a wealthy French woman who went to the United States after the end of the First World War to help in a charity that was looking after orphan children, uh, orphans of soldiers from the First World War. And in order to raise money, she um, made little poppies and sold them. That idea took on and also some poetry came into it as well, um, that the poppy would be a symbol of remembrance because of the Flanders fields poppies and the fact that they grew um, amongst the dead. Um, so that first of all started in the United States, then went to Canada and then the Royal British Legion in this country took it on uh, as a way of raising money for ex-servicemen, particularly those that had serious injuries. And at the bottom underneath Madame Guerin's uh, portrait is one of the very first um, uh, fabric uh, poppies. And in the 60th anniversary at the end of World War II, the poppies caused a great problem for the Royal Air Force because somebody in, in very senior command or a politician perhaps said it would be rather nice to drop them down the mile on, via Lancaster. Um, having flown in the Lancaster, it's a big aeroplane, having uh, some uh, idea of what it's like to fl uh, throw things out of aeroplanes and try and hit something. Um, this was a huge logistical exercise. And the fact that they did it so accurately is a tribute to everybody in the Royal Air Force who managed to do it on that day. And that photograph is particularly poignant for the 60th anniversary. But the poppy, I'm sure you know that there is a white poppy, which is the Peace Union. Um, I don't know whether you'd know there's also a purple poppy, which is for animals uh, in war. The French do not have the red poppy. They have the cornflower, because like the poppy, the cornflower also grows in the same way but they didn't think the poppy was appropriate because of course the French, ordinary French soldier's uniform consists of red breeches and a gray long gray, or did a long gray jacket. And the red breeches were the same color as the poppy. So in France, it's the Louis de France, the purple poppy. 
There have been many controversies over the various poppies. Um, the Royal British Legion take the view that you can wear a white poppy and a purple poppy and a red poppy. They do draw the line, although they, they're not public on it, on the rainbow poppy, which has also come out, the black poppy. Um, but the red poppy is, of course, the most significant one. And this is the reason. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row. But mark our place, and in the sky, the lark still bravely singing flies, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved. And now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders field. And now we've refined the ceremonial um, appropriately, in my view. Um, it's, this year has been uh, a little different. Um, I've chosen some images there. In 2014, they had the wonderful poppies in the Tower of London, and the last poppy of 888,246, which represented the number of British fallen in the First World War. The last poppy was laid by a bluecoat boy, Cadet Harry Hayes, and he there, uh, I think he was age 13 at the time, um, proudly saluting, having put the last poppy down in the moat of of the Tower of London. Um, I understand that Harry left in 2018 and uh, be interested to know whether we've heard much from him since. If he's anything like me, it'll take about 50 years. There's the ceremony in Whitehall, um, which we're used to with the veterans marching past. And of course, a couple of days later, uh, after the ceremony on the 11th of, of November, uh, there is a Jewish ex servicemen's uh, commemoration as well. And over the years, the commemorations have included um, the civilian aspects of war as well. Um, so particularly merchant mariners, miners, Bevan boys, and so on, which is terribly important. When we were at school, um, the memorial that you see in the bottom there was on the wall um, on the right of the main entrance to schoolhouse around the corner. And uh, I'm sure you will recall, particularly us boarders, uh, we would have a ceremony there obviously on the 11th of November um, in front uh, of that same plaque. I'm not sure when the new memorial was built, but I when I went to the school for the first time after so many years, I was delighted to see that whoever had chosen to build it had actually built a cenotaph. There's no religious motifs on it. It's brick and it is similar to an empty tomb, but it's the same memorial. Um, and uh, those of you may have watched the YouTube video that the school produced for this year's socially distanced Remembrance Day, but it is available on YouTube if you want to watch it. And of course, with the very good um, music element in the school today that the headmaster was talking about, a fantastic um, last post and revale, or rousing as it's often called, was played by one of the pupils from Blue Coats on a trumpet, um, although he doesn't need the valves, so he didn't uh, have to use them. But very finely played uh, and, a, and a super ceremony. And it's very nice to see any ceremony at Blue Coat today where the original uniform is worn. So Holm Park Memorials, I thought I'd talk about for a moment because I'm sh I wasn't that aware, but the school gates, of course, are a memorial. Um, Second Lieutenant Peter Huggins died during a, the Portsmouth Blitz 
in March 1941, there were two major, well, there were lots of attacks on Portsmouth for obvious reasons, um, but uh, there were two major blitzes, one in January and one in March. And uh, he was a uh, second lieutenant manning a uh, high, high altitude anti-aircraft battery on South Sea Common when he was killed on his 22nd birthday. And uh, I suspect, maybe Digby can tell us, but I suspect that those pupils at Bath Road uh, who would have known him as he would have been there, uh, it was Old Blues who put the money together to commemorate him on the school gates. He's also commemorated, of course, in the 1939-45 element of the school war memorial. And uh, all the names of those who were lost are read out every year. Uh, Peter Van Wendt reads them out, or read them out this year, certainly, um, and which is, of course, very important. We should remember them. But the thing I want to point out to you, uh, and this is, I think, something of the ritual and memorial that's got to go on to future generations and that is yes we honor our military and indeed we have a military covenant but we don't honor for example first responders in the same way and when you take the life of somebody serving in the military they are in danger for relatively particularly today relatively short periods of time of active duty. First responders get up in the morning and they go to work knowing they will run towards danger rather when everybody else is running away. And that was particularly the case in 1971 when Detective Constable Ian Howard saw a car in Reading that was suspicious and stopped it and called for help. And while he was calling for help he was shot nine times by two men who had just robbed uh, a school of their armory of weapons and their car was full of weapons. It also, our memorial, the school memorial, doesn't just cover the police officer who died, it also covers a pupil who died as a result of a terrorist mine. Um, that was a pupil on a gap year. Um, he was actually in Zimbabwe, Peter Van Wendt taught him, uh, David Pearson, he was running and stepped on a terrorist mine, lost his leg. His father was a doctor and thought that he should receive immediate treatment and be taken away by helicopter. But by the time the helicopter came, which was 18 hours later, I'm afraid he was dead. So our memorial doesn't just involve those who were killed on active service in wars, it also, and I think it's very important that it does, it includes those who have served in other ways as well. The importance of remembrance? Well, any of you who have read Primo Levi, um, periodic table, um, uh, his life as a Auschwitz um, Holocaust victim, and his subsequent life and his eventual death. He says why we should remember, because it happened and it could happen again. And that's why remembrance, I think, is important, not just remembrance of things to do with war, but also for people, old farts like us, who want to remember things that happened during our own lives. So at the going down of the sun, we shall remember them. And that is a typical scene from any village. That's my village of Solbury in Buckinghamshire. I ring the bells there, by the way, and I learned to ring them in St Andrews in Sonning when I was 12 years old. So school has a great influence on you. So let us remember that. Ladies and gentlemen, is the end of my presentation. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, there were questions after the session and one of the questions quite rightly asked me why I'd mentioned earlier in the presentation that New Zealand was different. Um, well, I answered that question by telling them what exactly happened with the poppies that were going to New Zealand. And in fact, the poppies didn't arrive in time for November the 11th, 1920, 
the ship was delayed, so the consignment of poppies from England didn't arrive on time. So being very pragmatic, the New Zealanders kept them in store and used them on the next appropriate occasion, which was on Anzac Day on the 24th of April, the next year, 1921. And thereafter, ever since then, uh, the Poppy Day in uh, New Zealand has been on Anzac Day, uh, not on, uh, on the 11th of November. So I hope you enjoyed it and I hope that it gave you some food for thought.